all for coming this evening. Uh, I assume everyone in this room wants to get rich. Is there anybody here who does not want to get rich? Assuming none, uh, I'm going to give you some ideas of how I've built some firms from scratch and uh, how you can apply an entrepreneurial view of life to creating a growth business. And our theme is, how do you create a growth company in a no-growth world? And there's three companies we're going to talk about. Uh, from left to right, Met Metro Bank, the first new bank in Britain since 18 1830. 1830. Pet plan is a pet health insurance and my bank, Commerce Bank in America. So as he, in, as he said, I started my first bank. I've done five new banks. Metro Bank is the fifth from scratch. And Commerce Bank was my first bank. I started when I was 27 out of Wharton. For some reason, the uh, banking regulators gave me a bank license to start a new bank. Um, now, banking is much different in America than it is here. When I started, there were 24,000 banks in America, 24,000. And there are still 7,000 separate banks in America. So we're a country of lots of small banks. So we started from scratch. How are we going to stand out from the crowd? As they said in the introduction, I started with nine people. I raised a million and a half in capital. That was the hardest million and a half I ever raised in my life with one office. And how could we change the relatively no growth business of retail banking into a high growth business? So we're going to start first on, on comp commerce. This is in 2006. This is 8,000 commerce people, commerce team members at Radio City Music Hall celebrating our annual awards ceremony. These are all Commerce Bank employees, and we mean to show you this for the excitement and the fun. We were able to turn the mundane business of retail banking into an exciting, fun business, and this is part of what we did. And of course, we never missed this slide. We were always, we, the last five years, we got the J.D. Powers Award for Best Retail Bank in America. And this is me on the stage of Radio City Music Hall receiving the award for the Best Retail Bank in America. And for you men, these are the Rockettes in the background. And their legs go to about here. Uh, now, as we said, this bank started with one office, and how are we going to take this business of banking and make it different? How are we going to add value? So over the years, as we grew slowly, um, we learned that the real value of a retail bank, and we're 50% commercial and 50% retail, the real value of a retail bank is in the core deposit base. The more dep deposits we receive from our consumers, and the longer they live at a lower rate, that's what creates value. Remember, the unique ability that banks have, we're the only types of businesses that are legally authorized to accept a deposit. All of you can make loans, but you can't accept deposits. So a banking license is really a government license to borrow money cheap. At the core, that's what a bank is. So we set out to turn this into a retailing business, and from the one office, it turned into 500, uh, along the East Coast, New York, and Metro Philly. Now, along the way, we decided this is a retailing business and the people care more about service and convenience than the rate. And I think I have some other charts. It shows the branch count on the side. So there's a lot of numbers on this chart, but what it says in 1990, we had 27 branch locations. Our assets were roughly $1 billion. US dollars and our market cap was 24 million. By 2000, and remember, we didn't acquire to grow. This is all we call a de novo built from scratch strategy. By 2000, our, we were up to, our, our locations were up to 150, our assets were 8.3 billion, and our market cap was up to 1.5 billion. Then in 2001, we decided to go in New York City. We had essentially been a suburban bank. And I was flying over in New York City when the, statue, when the World Trade Center was hit on September 11th. And believe me, they had no cl clue. So from 2000 to 2007, our branch count went from 150 to 400. 
Our assets grew from $8 billion to $45 billion, and our market cap went up to $8.5 billion. And you can see the compound growth rates on the right side of the chart. Yes, the right side of the chart. The words growth and bank are not supposed to fit together. But by redefining how this service is delivered, we managed to create this high growth business. Now, what was our philosophy? Core deposits create value. Customers will give us more of their deposits for a longer term for a better retail experience. We were actually the low rate payer in every market, not the high rate deposit rate payer, but the low rate payer. People want, will pay for a better retail experience. Apple is the clearest example today. Nobody buys Apple because it's cheap. You're buying the whole Apple environment. And I've learned over the years that great businesses have the ability to build fans. Fans are customers that join your company, they're loyal to your company, and they bring their friends. You cannot get sustained growth without fans. Now, I have a book out with the title of Fans, Not Customers. I believe we have, we have them. We sent a bunch over to hand, hand out. If we don't... We have them. So there'll be a copy of the book out. If you want to read it, be my guest. Steal as many ideas as you want. Lord knows I stole, stole all of them. But the core of our model is great businesses build fans. Now, how does that work out for us in America? So Forbes puts out a 2020 list every year. These are a list of public CEOs in America that have served 20-plus years and have a 20-plus compounded return. Only seven in this year made the list. Somehow this guy, Warren Buffett, got one notch above me. Who is this guy? Uh, and the point is, is not only our performance, but it's the point is how you can take the mundane business of retail banking and redefine it in a different way and create a growth business. I got a couple more charts about this because I like this so much. So if you invested with us in America when the bank started in 1973 and kept your investment to 07, your investment went up 470 times. If you invented, invested in 91 and stayed to 07, your investment went up 47 times in the mundane business of retail banking. Now, our theory is about building fans and building great brands. So this is a slide that talks about the basic three kinds of brands. The basic brand on, a, on the bottom it, it, is if I say Ford, you say car. You know, you know it, but nobody gets too excited. The next line up is if I say a brand name, you like it, it has a positive connotation. But the third level, the legendary brand, the customer and the company become one. They become fans. It would be Apple is certainly the current uh, example Na internationally. They would say that about John Lewis in Britain. I say John Lewis, you think good things about John Lewis. The object of every company is to get up this ladder and make the customer and you one. Now, how do we look about how we do, do this? So, after years of doing this, I believe there are three parts that really matter. A business model that is very clear and adds value. The customer sees it as a value-added model. And in my opinion, that's the most important thing. A business model that adds value, draws the consumer, and allows you to make money. And if you have a business model, and Lord knows we have to make it better all the time, then you have to build a culture to reinforce the model. Your culture has to be everywhere. It has to be unique to your model. And it has to re reinforce it. So many firms, the model and the culture are opposed. And if we get that right, Lord knows that's a problem, we've got to fanatically execute the model. In the States, our bank branches were getting visited 21 million times a month. So if you ask me what I had to 
uh, kept me awake at night is I got 21 million people walking into the doors every month. How are we going to make them happy and how we're not going to mess this up? So we had to design a model and a business execution model to make that happen. So I forgot I had these slides. So about model, add value, create an emotional brand, and your model has to be one that you can reproduce and prosper. Great retailers, particularly great chain store retailers, know if they build new stores, they're going to get predictable results from a certain level of sales. That is really the essence of what a chain store model is. And we would say in this case, that's an important part of model. So Metro Bank comes to Britain. That's my dog, of course. Um, this is the first new bank in Britain since 1830. I mean, it's unbelievable. When I say it, I can hardly get the words out. It's so unusual. And uh, we were approved and opened in 2010. There hasn't been a new bank approved since. As I said, this is the fifth new bank I, I've done. And if I remember how hard it was to do, I'm not sure I would have done, done it. So the risk at Metro was, could we get a license? Could we raise the capital? Could we build the IT? And would the Brits accept it? Thank God we solved all those pro pro problems. So as I say, it's the first new high street bank. Our re so we're in I'll talk about the three business. On the retail side, this is a seven day a week branch based biz business with online and mobile. We have 20 stores open now. We're gonna build 200 in greater London. My view of London, it might be different than yours. Mine is Brighton, Reading, and Milton Keynes on the north. We've raised 250 million pounds in private money uh, to finance this almost all American money. Now, this is not meant to be a better UK bank. This is about something completely different. It's to break every mold. It's to change everything the way we do. It's done by the banks here. And we get to start with a fresh slate. No, no antique IT, no out-of-date facilities, uh, no cultures that don't work, no legacy of problems. It is based on our model in America, and the ability to start fresh is a big advantage. Uh, for those of you that know about banks, you can fund it with what we call core deposit funding or wholesale funding. Many would argue that the bank failure in Europe and Britain was because of the wholesale funding was all out of balance here. The smallest banks in Mississippi have better IT than the banks here. The state of bank IT in Britain is 40 years behind the world. It's amazing they can even get the lights turn, turned on. Um, and we built, we bought a pa packaged IT system as we do in the states, um, and it's a tremendous advantage. We're 50% consumer, but 50% commercial. As bad as the banks mistreat the customers here, the consumer customers, what they do to the small business here is shockingly bad. We, it says we have 150,000 accounts. The actual number is 229. So this idea that the Brits won't change banks and they won't accept this, we are opening accounts and building this business at rates I have never seen in my life. And the Metro Bank model is we see ourselves as a growth retailer that happens to be a bank. We don't steal ideas from the banks. We get them from Apple, John Lewis, Amazon. This is a growth retailing company. And the, the American term is power retailer, a retailer that redefines how a service or product is delivered. Home, de Home Depot in America is a good example of that. We've talked about deposits before. We've talked about customers and fans. And the market, when you're raising money, either in the beginning or along the way, the stock market pays for high predictable growth. You can talk about all the financial metrics you're going to learn. High predictable growth is what the market pays for. Culture, I talked a little bit about culture. It's got to match your model, must be everywhere. We hire for attitude and train for skills. People ask me what's the hardest thing I have to do running this model in Britain. And we laughingly say it's to get, it, it's, it's to get the Brits to smile. 
so uh, it's retail banking is not very hard. You can train pretty much a kid to you know, work in a branch. It's how, how you deliver, not what you deliver. We overtrain, we over reinforce, and everyone owns stock in the company in one form or another. I'm a great believer in options. I may be the last great believer in options. Now, execution, I told you, is very important. You can talk about this, you can talk about your culture and model, but if you don't deliver, it doesn't mean anything. So we have an endless kill a stupid rule policy. It's to kill every stupid rule we can find in banking. As you can imagine, there's an endless number of stupid rules. Every computer on all of our desks have a kill a stupid rule button that goes to a kill a stupid rule department. And every day we find something to improve. So here's just a couple of simple ones. Why shouldn't a retail bank be open every hour that the consumer wants? So we're open seven days a week, basically eight to eight, just like any other retailer would. On the right, all of you, particularly the men, have a jar of coins at home and you don't know what to do with them. So we have the magic money machine, which are free self-service self, self coin counting machines. You, you bring your jar in, you dump them in, you get a receipt. You don't need the bank with us to use them, and they're free. Another reason to visit Metro Bank. Those of you who have been in a branch bank, and I'm sure a lot of you haven't for a long time, they have this pen. They have it anchored to the check counter. They've got to protect this pen. <laughs> Um, and, of course, the pen's not there most of the time. Uh, uh, so in 2007 in America, I gave away 28 million pens. And I'd be happy if I gave that many away in, in Britain. Um, I'll skip the van, but I'll do the one on the bottom right. So my wife was shopping at a Chase branch in Manhattan not the bank there, just to see what they were doing. And she has our, our great looking dog there, of course, my Yorkie, and the guard wouldn't let her into the Chase office. So she calls me on the cell phone and says, is there some rule about bringing dogs into banks? I said, absolutely not. So, although the banks generally won't let you bring your dogs in. So we turn that into the dog's rule policy. We want you to bring your dog, we have a treat, we have water bowls. We give you water bowls to take home. If you ask half the people in London about us, they would say the dogs. Now, the customers take that to mean, if this bank loves my dog, they must love me. And all of these parts, the coin counting, the seven days, they all fit together in a pattern of delivering a message. So, from a standing start in 2010, these are, this is our retail store location in Greater London. As I said, my view is Brighton, Reading, and Milton Keynes. The red stores are open. The white ones are coming in the next 12 months. And actually, the white ones with a circle are under construction now. And I'll show you a couple of them uh, in a minute. This is Reading. For those of you who have been in Reading, there's 350,000 people in Reading. It's about an hour from London. And this is on the high street in Reading. It's carved out of a mall called the Broad Street Mall. This two-story glass glitzy building is what our brand's about. It's as non-bank as we know how to make it. Slough for those of you who don't know, is a suburban town out by, the air, by, out by the airport. And this is our slough building. This has a drive-through window in the back. Those of you who have lived in America know what that means. This is the only drive-through branch bank in Britain. Every suburban American branch bank has drive-ins, but somehow the Brits never got that part. So you can see the same kind of look. Now, how have the Brits accepted us? As I said, we're growing unbelievably fast. I may have a chart about this, but this is brand awareness. So if you look on the left in April, on, of the working full-time people, 71% of the people know our brand already. If this was Metro New York, that number would be 7 to 10%. It's an unbelievably high brand identification in such a short period of time in such a large market. 
and because it's new and it's different. And where are we going? So by 2020, this will be a $25 billion bank which, with 150-some offices, which means our market cap will be roughly 5 billion pounds. And, of course, that's not the end. I just ran out of chart. Uh, it just, keep, it just keep, keep, keeps on going. Again, a very high-growth company in a low-growth business. Now, let me take the other side. So Metro Bank is an American model transported to Britain. And I might say that Metro runs my exact American model, and everything we did in Manhattan works better here. So two British kids, a husband and wife, were going to Wharton. They had a sick cat, and they couldn't afford a $5,000 bill. And they also had to do some business development project for Wharton. And as you know, pet plant, some of you may know that pet, pet health insurance was invented in Britain, basically. And one third of the pets have health insurance. We believe the penetration rate in America is 0.5. There's 175 million pets in America. So these two got the American license for pet plan, the world's leader, for essentially free. And this applies to all of you. They had never run a business. They had never worked in a business. They had never started a business. They had never been in the insurance business. And they had zero money. So that's where you guys all start, right? Uh, yet somehow they got Pet Plan to give them the American license for free. They raised three or four million dollars to, to get going. I am the chairman of this. And they're off to the races to convince America that pet health insurance is what they need. Um, it's just pretty much what I told you there. It's actually a very fun business. Um, let me go back here for a minute. Oops, that's me. There's my dog again. They were different in that they decided to do this as a pet business to, ha to happen to sell insurance instead of an insurance business. This is before I even met them. So they and their clients are attached. They send birthday cards to the pets. I mean, it's all intertwined with the dogs and, and cats. And that simple change of being a pet business instead of insurance business change the dynamics uh, with their customers. They're number two in America, but we got a long way to go. This is stuff about pet insurance. And their philosophy is much like mine. Build fans, not customers. Treat policyholders as a family. Be a pet company. When they get 1% of the American pets insured, 1%, their revenue will be $900 million. Now, what have I learned during this long journey? Emotional brands create va va value. No one needs a me too anything. You have to be different and you have to be better. Building fans, you've heard me say, creates great brands. Our brand is who we are, what we are, what our customers expect. Everything, well, I got it down further, I'll skip one. Everything we do, every hour of every day, makes our brand weaker or stronger. And those of you that are going to start a business or going to work in a business, this idea about brand is the most important. The way you answer the phone, the way your sign looks, the way your store looks, all of these things play into your model. The customer expects great brands to be better next month than they are this month. If it turns out the iPhone 5S is not as good as the iPhone 5, and I think we're all waiting to see if that's true, their brand degrades. And when you're a high performer, the customer's expectations are very high. And finally, great brands and great models create value in any business or any market. And I'll leave this one up, if I can get this to work here. Oops, hold on a minute. That's my, those are my comments. Please ask me whatever you would like. There's nothing I haven't been asked, I don't think. Go ahead.
virtual service center. Um, I guess my question is, where do you see the investment going towards retail branches, physical branches, versus the online presence in the virtual world? So we talk about the branch side, but every customer uses online, every customer uses mobile, every study ever, ever done in my personal experience is the branch, the look, feel, and location of the branch is your connection with the client. And all, no one has ever succeeded in retail banking without a branch network. And essentially, every online-only bank in America here has failed. So maybe years out, that's true. But we're certainly a long way from that. Uh, I, I've flipped the question to you. Why does Apple build stores? So you know, these are all half-truths. But uh, remember, at the core, we're in the new account opening business. We don't want to open accounts if, if they don't come into the store. And the customer wants to come into the store. So I say they're all related. We've got to deliver the best in every delivery channel. But none of them have yet replaced another. And everybody's predicted the uh, demise of the branch has been wrong. Maybe some year they'll be right. How, how Sorry, can you want for the microphone, please? It's not working. How do you see the competition in Britain developing? I mean, you've got um, RBS divesting its branches, Lloyd's divesting, um, Aldemore is is another competitor, Virgin Money. So there seems to be a lot more than the five high street banks that used to exist, and now you have a bigger pool of players. And this and is the, the least competitive banking market in Europe and America. You've got five big banks here that operate like a cartel should. They overcharge, they underserve, they underinvest. They're so big, they're so broken, they can't be fixed. I've quoted them saying that they, they must be the best bankers in the world if they can run the banks with the crap IT they have. Um, so they asked me at Parliament, I was at the select committee, they asked me sort of the same question. And I said, you decide. There's six major banks that count in, in Britain. Metro New York alone has 173 different bank charters. So we're, we're, we're very used to operating in a uh, very diverse competitive market. There's plenty of room. But the core position is here, you've got five big banks that are seriously broken, and I'm not sure they can be fixed. It's that bad. And part of it, I know a lot of you people are into the IT side. They have IT that's so bad, it's unbelievable. And when you get this big and this broken, we might not have enough money left in the world to fix some of these IT systems. So my problems are not the competition. I don't care about the competition. If you remember the earlier chart, I went into Manhattan against the serious players and created major market share from scratch. Our risk is much more, are we going to mess this up than it is what they're, 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 they're going to do. Um, my question is about brand awareness. Um, like how did you achieve that unbelievable uh, brand awareness? <clears throat> how do you get the unbelievable yeah, this, brand awareness? Yeah, the 71% yeah. that you uh, mentioned. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'll give you a couple half-truths. Uh, we're new. We're fresh. The, everybody in Britain hates the current banks. I don't have to tell them their banks are bad. They all know it. The press has been beating up on the banks. The press has been extremely good to us. We spend very little on marketing. Um, so we promised something different. We delivered something different. Just this week, we were named the best current account in Britain by the mail. And in another study, you money or once something came out for the study where they rated the retail banks in Britain. And so the top was a 100-point scale. 100 was the best. Barclays score was four. <laughs> we were the highest bank at 77 out of 100. Four out of 100. So we are different. We do deliver what we promise. The press has been really good to us. And contrary to what this gentleman asked me, the competition helps me every day. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Vernon, thanks for uh, your presentation. Uh, just to follow on question on competition, the, the regulator over here has created arguably much bigger barriers to entry in the last five years for new banks. And as you said, there's, uh, you're the first bank in, uh, in nearly 200 years. Clearly, that's in your interests uh, as a new bank coming in. Is it in ours to have such big barriers to entry uh, which are put up in the, in the name of protecting us as depositors? I think that one of the reasons the big banks have developed so bad is because they've had no one new to compete with them. And the core of business banking philosophy in Britain is they're doing you a favor by letting you bank with them. When you get down to the rock bottom, that's what it's all about. That's why their service is terrible. That's why the buildings are terrible. That's why they give you all this ridiculous stuff. We open a current account in 15 minutes. You walk out with your permanent debit credit card, your PIN number, your credit approved, and your online active. Go to Barclays and try to open a current account and see what happens, guys. Um, so definitely, I think there should be more competitors. On the other hand, this is hard. This is hard. You know, banks are much more comp complicated. IT is much more complicated. Anti-money laundering is much more complicated. So. I'll give, you, I give you, I'll give you a little joke about this, and all the Brits won't be offended when I tell this joke. So I get this asked question all the time. And I say to them, you know, new banks is really an American idea, and it is true this idea of lots of banks is a much more American idea. But could it be that the culture in Britain would be, if you wanted to start a bank, you'd get 10 friends who'd find, hire 10 consultants who'd find 100 reasons why it wouldn't work? Well, there is a lot of truth to that. And if you look at the culture between the Brits and Americans, I tell this to my Brits all the time, and our management is all Brits. The American business philosophy, let's start with the result we want and figure out how they, to get there. The British philosophy, let's start at the beginning and see what happens. That is a fundamentally different view of life. Hi, how are you? What you would have done differently in this past almost four years? Yeah, uh, what would I have done differently is what he asked. It's going so unbelievably well, I can't be be believe it. Um, I wouldn't have done anything differently, really. It's been tremendous. It's been absolutely tremendous. The customers have accepted it. Uh, our our ma management team has you know, bought in. Uh, nothing's gone wrong yet. <laughs> Something will. <laughs> Can you give us some suggestions of how to build an emotional brand in an online business where there isn't as much human interaction, if you have any suggestions? See, I don't agree with that, what you just asked, your premise. I, 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 Amazon is an emotional brand. And what do we like about a a Amazon? Yes they're, yes, they're quick, but what do we really like about Amazon? One click. When you get right down to it, what's Amazon have that nobody else has? They have a patent on one click. They've made it easy, they've made it convenient, and they've made it fun. So I would say that you can build an emotional brand on, online. In some ways it's easier, in some ways it's harder. But that's your challenge. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when you were first starting out? Uh, you said the first million and a half you raised was the hardest money you've ever raised. Can you just talk about some of the challenges you faced when you were, when you were young with only just a few people working with you? I had no people work, working with me. That's how many people I have. So you, I had worked in a small bank. So I knew people. I knew people in the community. And I went around to them and said, we're going to start a new bank. Give me 20000 or 40000 and by the way, I'll get a loan for you if you need to borrow money. Because none, none, none of us had any money. I probably borrowed mine too. When you're doing these entrepreneurial things, it's your relationship with the people you're dealing with more than the charts and the spreadsheets. I don't think we had charts and spreadsheets then. It's been so long I can't remember. But it's about sales. You have to have a vision, you have to have a passion, and you have to convince people that your vision's going to work. So when I raised money for Metro Bank in Britain, I raised 100 million pounds to start. 
And I went to Fidelity and Wellington and all the big funds and all of them put up money before we had a banking license, before we were open, because they had seen me use this model in America and believed that I could do it. But when you're out raising the first 500,000 or the million, it's all about you. It's all about you, it's all about your idea, and it's all about your model. It's no more involved than that. Uh, hi, thank you. <coughs> Building on that question, um, once you get your first five million, so sorry, one million, you have it in some bank account, and then like the rush you might felt at that time and the responsibility with your investors, how you go about that? And, and it's more like a personal question, but you're, how you go about that? Well, not only that, in a bank, you don't now have to worry about the people that invest with you, but you have to worry about the people that open their deposit account with you because they're entrusting your savings to you. It's the same answer I had for this gentleman back. It's about you. Certainly you feel the burden, but that drives you to succeed. This is all about everybody in this room, guys. It's all about you. It's not very much about what you learn here. Yes, you get tools. Yes, yes you get skills. Yes, you know theory. But in the end, it's about you. And everything in business life is about sales. And it begins with selling yourself. And if you're not able to sell yourself, you're, going to fa you're not going to succeed the way you want to. And, you know, the guys that are more techie type guys, they seem to skip that, that, that part. When I'm investing in you, or frankly, when we're making a commercial loan to you, you've got to convince us that you have a business that makes sense and you know what you're doing. It all comes down to us. And, you know, you come into a meeting with 12 people in your team and this guy worked there. That doesn't matter. It's about you. Who else? Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I love Metro branches. I think Thank you, my brilliant. friend. I lo and I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's, so much, there's so much clear value you guys offer. It's fantastic. Um, but what I haven't got any experience of, and I'd love to hear you, because in a way, your sales and your customers are the people you make loans to, right? Because you, you borrow from, effectively, the, custom, the people like me, if we put deposit in, are your investors, effectively, and, and you're sure. loaning. But um, I don't know, uh, you haven't necessarily spoken as much about, I don't get well, that sense in the balance. I haven't talked about the other side of the balance sheet, which is the lending side, primarily. Yeah. And the reason I haven't talked about it, and I will in a moment, is, is my philosophy that the core deposits are your real value creator. Buffett says he makes all his money on the insurance float, the time between you pay your premium and he has to pay a claim. All these deals he does and these investments is financed by the insurance premium float. And that's what this is. Now, on the lending side, in Britain, we're a commercial lender prior, primarily, although we do consumer lending, but the bigger numbers are the commercial loan. There's only one way to do commercial lending. Recruit teams of commercial lenders who bring clients with them and go out and attract new business. There's no, mass marketing is almost of no value. So it's a much more one-on-one -on -one business. Um, what were the main challenges when you were scaling up the business? Here? Uh, yeah. Well, of course, raising the money is always a good challenge. But let me, let me start th at the beginning. Um, I sold my bank in 2007, and I literally had nothing to do for nothing to do. And a friend of mine who'd been trying to get me to come to Britain with this model called me up and said, "You had no excuse, excuse now. Let's try to do this in Britain." I got on the plane, came over, walked through a few banks, went and talked to the government. Now, this was in 2007. Now, remember, the world died in 2008, so this was all during this period. So the first issue was, could we get a license from the FSA, the UK government, who didn't know how to grant a new license, I might add. Um, then I had to raise the money, and I had to raise it, raise it twice. I had it all raised in, two, in September of 2008. I'm flying back to the States with the money committed, and Lehman goes broke. So I had to start over again. 
and I had 20 million pounds of my own money at risk during all this. Then the next risk was no one here had ever used what we call packaged IT system. The banks here still have their own homegrown software and they literally write code here. Uh, it's almost unbelievable. So could we get a modern, affordable IT system in a bank in Britain that worked? And we solved that problem. And then we, could we recruit people to manage out of the existing British system who believed in our view of life? And I always believed in America and here there are good bankers trapped in broken bank models, and it's my job to get them. Uh, and then just execute, then just execution. So when the first store opened in August in 2010, you know, you're scared to death. Is no one going to show up? Is going to be a is going to be a dud? You know, I'm driving to the store and I'm wondering what's going to happen here. The place was completely overwhelmed with customers and press. There were 14 TV TV crews filming at the branch. The morning show on BBC One did a show live from our branch that morning. I did an interview for North Korean TV. I didn't know they had TV in North Korea. <laughs> uh, but that's the fear. And frankly, every new location you open, you have this fear that this is the one that's not going to work. But you know, you just have to put your head down and work through the pro pro problems. Actually, it's been fairly easy when I think of all the things that could have gone wrong. Hi, so what's the biggest personal kind of lesson that you learned from commerce that you then changed your personal approach in Metrobank? I didn't change anything. I didn't change anything. At commerce, I was the CEO for the whole time. I'm the chairman here. Thank God I have a full-time CEO. I don't have to deal with all the crap you have to deal with in a bank every day. Um, but now, my lesson's pretty much the same. You build a model, you refine your model, you execute the model. I learned in America, as I was expanding throughout the East Coast of America, I used to hire bankers, and they would tell me, oh, it's different in this part of America, it's different in North Jersey, it's different in New York, it's different on Long Island. When I finally stopped listening to it's different, that's when the growth curve went like this. We were, when I decided this was our model, and we're going to run in a suburban market or a downtown market, that's what really got the momentum going. So when we came here, of course, it's different in Britain, it's different in London, we don't do this, we don't do this at Lloyd's. We said, forget all that. This is our model, and this is what we're going to run. So I guess that's the one lesson I, I've learned. If you have a model and you believe in your model, go execute your model. And 90% of what my British friends told me was going to happen here didn't happen. Oh, this dogs. No, the Brits don't care about their dogs. And who wants to bank at the bank on sun, sun, Sunday? And nobody. I got a lot of abuse about these. These are M lapel pins. Oh, that's much too gauche to run to uh, for for the British to wear a lapel pin. It's all bull. I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. Who else? Thank you, Vernon. Um, just, I'm also a very happy customer Thank of yours, you. by Thank the way. Thank you. I want to, yeah. And Claire Palmer here from our private banking group. And for tonight's event, we're classifying all of you in the private banking group. We'll take <laughs> care of all of you that need help. Go Fantastic. Ahead. So, so the, the thing that really caught me when I was sort of opening my account was that three pounds that you give as a gift. Right, when we put it in your account. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it has such a big impact even though it's such a small amount. Right. Of, it, I'm, I was just calculating the numbers so you have 255,000 accounts, three yeah, pounds each, 750,000 over all these years. How have you gotten your team to think about these things? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is innovation within your bank coming from the bottom up or is it from the top down? You, you touched a bit, little bit about it in terms of that well, little button that you have. Well here it's coming from the top down mm -hmm. and my wife in America and here did the architecture, does the architecture design, marketing, and branding. And we are so fanatical about the brand, she is the brand queen. Our bankers are not allowed to change a form that doesn't go through brand approval. And here's why. If we have a form letter we're sending somebody, if we don't watch them, 
they'll take a form letter from Lloyd's and, and, and put Metro on and send it out. So I have learned, to this gentleman's question, if you want to have a great brand, you have to be unbelievably extreme about it. I mean un beyond extreme about it, because if you don't, you drift back. The, bet the biggest risk to Metro Bank is we become only a better UK bank. I can't let that happen. And we all see it with Apple. No matter what they say at Apple, with Steve Jobs gone, it's not the same place. Right, guys? We all, we all, we all agree on that. So uh, we're just so fanatic. And when you're in the store to do it, you see it, the door, door handles, the look, the door, the whole, the, whole, the whole thing. There's a funny story about banking in Britain. You asked me about the competition. So all the big banks have basically told their customers with safe deposit boxes to close them and leave the bank. And Barclays comment was, it's increasingly complex to manage safe deposit boxes. Most of you don't even know what they are. Here's how increasingly complex they are. You sign a form, we hand you a key. That's how complex they are. But the big bank's philosophy is, the customer's a problem, the customer's a nu nuisance, let's get rid of the nuisance. So I can't build enough safe deposit boxes. Thank you. Who else? This side of the room. Uh, you talked a lot about sort of training and how important that is. I was wondering, Tra training? Training, ab yeah. absolutely. I was wondering from your perspective sort of uh, how you get to train and motivate the people uh, below you, both in your top management team as well as in the branch, to provide the level of service that you commit to and you expect out of them. Right. So how do we do tra training and how, how do we execute the model? So first of all, again, it goes back to the business model. We have to understand what our model is. So we recruit people who, whose personality we think matches our model. We hire for attitude, we train for skills, except for the very high skill jobs. And people ask me all the time, what's the hardest thing I have in Britain to do? And I say it's to get the Brits to smile. Um, but we have 900 plus people, we're hiring 500 people a year. Obviously that's a major league product, pro project. But it's, it's recruiting hopefully the right people and putting them in our model and the ones that don't make it, flushing them out of our model. But it's the model that drives the results. The people have to execute the model, and the ones that do are stars, and the ones that don't go, go someplace else. Now, we're very, very controlling about how they deliver the model. Um, just a million little things to get it right. We have a couple of things, that, we have a couple tools that we use. Um, we have a saying for our staff, one to say yes, two, two to say no. If a customer asks us a quick, quick, quick question, our people have two choices. Say, yes, sir, let me go take care of it, or let me go find somebody to get this problem solved for you. They're not allowed to say no. Now, I hope that's what's happening all the time, but the whole idea is that changes the dynamic between you, the customer, and the bank. Try one of the banks in Britain and see what happens. And another little tool that I learned years ago is uh, we have a database called Metropedia, for obvious reasons. It's the answer to every question we've ever been asked, updated every day. And every employee has access to it. The answer to every question we've been we ever been asked, updated every day with the appropriate forms and bump up to it. That alone dramatically improves the service level. I don't know how you run a big business without it, and it's very uncommon. But of course, that's our never-ending battle. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry, over here. Um. I would like to know a bit more about your entrepreneurial journey. So you said you basically founded five banks. When was the time? I literally you... woke up one morning and said, I'm going to do a bank from scratch. I had worked in a bank. I, I, I went to Wharton. I worked in a bank while I went to Wharton. I worked in banks for four or five years, sort of part time. When I went to Wharton full time, I worked in a bank 
full time. And the joke in this bank was, I used to go to class at 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and the joke in this little bank was you couldn't get a loan till noon because I didn't get there from class. So, and that's probably pretty true. So I had, but people ask me all the time, I literally woke up one morning and said, I'm going to go get a bank charter and start. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have consultants. I literally said, I'm going to put my head down and do it. And the same thing in Britain. Once I came over and shopped for a week or so, I said, I'm going to go make this ha happen. Um, it's all about you again. I mean, obviously, I have to drive to make it. One question I get asked in Britain all the time that you would, I never get asked in America is, well, you made a lot of money. Why are you bothering to do this again? Well, that's a British question, not an American question, because <laughs> this is what we do. But I mean, and all these things I've done, I've got lots of other businesses I'm involved in and I haven't discussed here today. Uh, you just do it. You make up your mind and do it. And everything that can go wrong will, and you've got to work your way through it. But like, guys, I, I should have said one thing to start this time. I talk at Harvard, Columbia, and Wharton a lot. And here's, a, here's my message to you. Every one of you is great at something. You are better at something than everybody else in this room and probably this school. People that are great successes in life, no matter what field they are, are lucky enough to match up their unique talent with, the, with their vocation in life. Chefs taste the food different than the ordinary people do. Great musicians hear the music completely different than we do. If you understand what you're great at, go pick your vocation to match it. I was lucky enough to sort of wander into this. Anybody else? Yeah. Sorry. Um, hi. I'm just wondering, what's your growth um, plan for Metro Bank in terms of long term? Are you thinking just UK-based or are you thinking of yeah, taking that outside? Yeah, this is a UK-based only business. Okay. Um, when we get 5% of the London market, only 5%, if I, if I only get 5%, I'm going to be an unhappy camper. That's a 50 billion pound bank with a market cap of 8 to 10 billion. So that's plenty to do. Banking is so intertwined in the society and the government of each country. I, and the British bank, the American system was modeled after the British system 200 years ago. So the words mean the same thing. The system works pretty much the same. But Germany and France is completely diff different. So I don't have enough years left to try it someplace else. Well, a couple over here. Quick one. You talk about the importance of branding and of trust, uh, especially in this business. How did you come up with the term Metro Bank in light of that? So before I answer your question, I'm going to give you a story about I gave a talk to this Harvard. Harvard has done a case study on com commerce. So I would go up and talk to a couple classes every year. And a group pretty much like this, of course, they're Harvard, you understand. Um, this woman stands up and goes on this long rant about how did you pick your name, Commerce, and how did you do your logo, and how do you pick your red color. Now, she's making a speech for the students, of course. And she's getting on my nerves about this. <laughs> But partially, the business schools teach you that's what you should, should do. You should hire a consultant. You should do all this. Literally, I said to her, we got the newspapers out for our metropolitan market. No one else had the name Commerce, and no one else had read. We laid them out on the floor and picked it out. Now, Metro is the name that I have always wanted to use in a bank. I've used it in other businesses. Remember, you've got to get names that are not commonly used in the banking business. It's short, it's zippy, it has a nice feel to it. We just liked it. If you're asking me if we did any research, I'm, I'm anti-market re -re research. I don't think I've ever done any market research. It's 99% gut. So whoever teaches market research around here, I guess he doesn't like me. <laughs> uh, and this is the home of market research. There is so much more market research here than there is in America. It's amazing. Sure. Uh, fantastic presentation, thank you. Uh, do you have your eye on any other industries that you wish to disrupt? Yeah, I don't have one right. I don't have one right now. I like banking and pet insurance at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I invest in other 
other businesses, some of them people a little, little past your age, a little more advanced. But we want businesses that are disruptive businesses, and they don't have to be high-tech modern business. I mean, Home, De Home Depot in America, they sold, they sold nails and hammers, and their market cap got up to 80 billion U U.S. It's about reinventing how you deliver a product and service, not necessarily what business you're, you're in. But I'm sure you'll come to me with a good, good idea, right? <laughs> So uh, you said to find what you're great at. What, what, what exactly you do you at? can... What are you great, great, great Me? Great yeah, you. Uh, I like to think that I'm good at inspiring and enthusing people to uh, align with ideas. And how does that translate into making money? Uh, <laughs> um, it's to do with getting, getting people on your side and working in a similar direction, whether that's customers yeah. or a team or, or right. whatever. But, but uh, don't you think you have to do it yourself first before you inspire other people? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I just gave up my job to start my own venture, so right, I, I'm trying to. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. I'm just fighting with you. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to know was, uh, do you consider yourself to be excellent at brands or customers, or you know, what, what is it that you are actually great at that you would consider? Um, no one in America had really merged retail ideas with the banking business, and what we did. My first business was developing sites for McDonald's. And I, I did hundreds of sites around the country for McDonald's. And some have written that that had an influence on my view of life. And it probably does. So we merged these two ideas of what a bank is and what a retailer is, and we turned it into what you see. What am I good, good, good at? I'm pretty good at sales. I'm pretty good at branding. And I'm pretty good, it's, it, it, it is and was not a very common idea that the value of a bank is in the deposit side, not the lending side. 90% of the bankers you, you'll talk to say, oh, all the value is in, in, the, in the loan side of the business. I don't believe that's true. And believe me, I was the loan voice forever. <coughs> and when you're, the loan, you, you, when you're the loan voice, you're going to be attacked by your competition, by the media, by the government, you're going to be attacked by, every, by everybody. And you just have to put your head down. So we have time for one more, one last question. Anyone who hasn't asked? Is anyone who hasn't asked a question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> time pressure. Uh, actually, I would like to know more. How do you see Metro Bank when it reaches maturity phase? Uh, for example, Apple has now reached maturity phase, and I would like to know how you see this fresh brand, uh, Metrobank. How, what's, the, what's the last time? So how, would, how do you see Metrobank when it reaches a maturity phase? It's never going to get to, it's never gonna get to mature, 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 maturity. Our goal is 100% of the UK deposit market. When I get 100%, I'll figure out how to expand the, the market. Okay. So to talk about maturity stage, um, it, it is true that companies go through lifestyles. They're born, they're infants, they're teenagers, they're young adults, they're mature, they're dead. I mean, those are the stages. Um, yeah, my goal is 100% in the market. And when the market gets, when, if we ever get to that, we'll go into some other market. You can't, we grew at Commerce 25% compounded for all these years, even when we got to big scale. So we just keep on doing, keep on doing this. Oh, okay, thanks. We got one more back here, which I'll, I'll take if you want. Okay. What do you do in your spare time or hobbies? Yeah, I play golf. I built a I built a golf course in America, so I play play, play golf. But um, generally, this is what I do. <laughs> you, you want to end on that note? Uh, uh, we got one, 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 one more gentleman oh, with the same. Uh, yes, hi. Um, first of all, we all hear about mobile money, sorry, mobile payment. So 
My question is, where can see mobile payment in the next five years? All the bank should be start worried about- The question about is, where, where do I see the future of mobile payment? Exactly, and is the bank in this should be start worried about sort of- Remember, every payment, whatever the form is, has to go through the banking system. So mo mobile payments are just credit cards in a different form. Every payment goes to a bank. They all come back to the banks. The payment systems are completely controlled by the banks. Do customers want mobile banking? Absolutely. Do they want mobile payment systems? Maybe. But none of this replaces the core function of banking, which has been around for 10,000 years. What you're talking about is another way to deliver the service. So do I worry about it? What I worry about is to make sure my mobile banking functions great. The, com the what? The commission. Pay every PayPal payment goes through the banks. Do you know that? Uh, maybe you're right, but it's not on my... I got to solve problem immediately, and it's certainly a bigger issue than I can solve. But remember, the banks control the payment systems, and I don't think that's going to change in our lifetimes. Great. Well, on that note, Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you so much.